Henry's religion is something that we historians endlessly argue about. Was he a Catholic? Was he a Protestant? Um, was he a, a humanist follower for, of Erasmus? Well, it's not a question you could actually have asked in Henry VIII's own time, because the word Protestant was only just beginning to be used at the time. Catholic was a word that people did use, and in fact, Henry would certainly have regarded himself throughout his life as a Catholic. One of the problems, I think, is that um, lots of the religious figures of the 16th century, Luther, Calvin, um, found a tradition which continues through to the present day. And Henry doesn't found any kind of tradition. The Church of England doesn't most of the time really want to claim Henry as its founder, although in, in one sense he clearly was. Perhaps one of the words that English people would have used to describe what we call Protestants would have been Lutherans. And of course, Henry VIII was never a Lutheran. He'd himself written a book against Luther in 1521, and at no point in the rest of his life did he ever repudiate the theological views on the generalities of Christian doctrine that he expressed there. The one point Henry did have in common with the Protestants, of course, was the break with Rome, repudiating the authority of the Pope. We could probably say that if it wasn't for the Protestant Reformation going on in Europe at the time, in which so many city-states small-time princes and theologians had broken with Rome, perhaps that idea wouldn't have seemed politically possible to Henry. So for a start, the, the context of the Protestant Reformation helps make it imaginable for him to do it. What Henry um, has, I think, is a very eclectic, very personal theology um, that in some ways doesn't make a great deal of consistent theological sense to others, but it does to Henry. There are signs that even before the break with Rome, he was skeptical about pilgrimage, that he was uh, skeptical about chantries and purgatory. He doesn't really seem very drawn to this idea that the souls of the dead have to suffer through purgatory and, and be helped um, by the prayers of, of the living. It's not entirely clear why this is, um, partly, I think, because purgatory is very much tied up with the idea of indulgences, those certificates from the Pope that let you off a certain amount of time in purgatory, which had so upset Martin Luther, and anything connected with the authority of the Pope, um, Henry really doesn't like. Um, another possibility, I think, is that Henry feels that purgatory is somehow a bit of a, 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 a get-out, that you can be sinful in this life and yet somehow pay it off in the next life. And, and Henry never believes with letting people off anything. Um, so Henry's theology, in a way, is a bit kind of uncomfortably stranded between Catholic and Protestant ideas, because he rejects the Catholic idea of, of purgatory and his King's Book of 1543, with which he's closely involved, in fact, bans people from using the word purgatory, um, which had been so much part of uh, the uh, medieval religion uh, of this country. On the other hand, he was uh, very much um, uh, a champion of the Eucharist and of traditional Catholic beliefs about the Eucharist. More than most people, Henry's theology is rather idiosyncratic. Um, it's a mixture of ideas that are traditional and reformist at once. So on, on some matters, he's intensely conservative. Uh, he's firmly attached to that in mass, for example. Um, the theological opinion, which is completely unacceptable in Henry's reign, um, is to suggest that the, the blessed bread at the mass is not actually and literally the body of Christ. And on one occasion in 1538, Henry himself um, presides very theatrically over the trial of a heretic, John Lambert, who's dared uh, to utter this opinion. Um, he's conservative about um, confession. Um, he's very conservative about clerical celibacy. Celibacy um, for other people is something that Henry is very keen on. Um, so even when he dissolves the monasteries, the former monks and nuns have to remain celibate. Um, but at the other, on the other hand, he's very radical and non-traditional in, in other ways. I mean, he brings down the monasteries, which are institutions that have been part of the very fabric of Christianity in England uh, for the best part of a thousand years. Um, he seems to be deeply anti-clerical. He doesn't like the pretensions of priests and bishops, and he loves cutting them down to size. Um, and he's also very keen on the Bible uh, and the authority of, of Scripture. It doesn't make him a Protestant, because Henry's interpretation of the Bible is always very much his own one. Um, but we have to remember, of course, that 
going back to what starts off his Reformation, which is the need to um, get an annulment, a declaration of nullity for his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Usually a monarch like Henry would expect the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, to be able to sort out his matrimonial problems for him. But in this particular case, the Pope wasn't willing to help out in the accustomed way. Henry was determined that he needed a male heir to succeed him on the throne. And in fact, he became convinced that his marriage to his brother's widow was cursed by God. Uh, there were two contradictory passages, really, in the Old Testament, which Henry latched onto, one of which said you should marry your brother's widow if your brother died childless, the other one of which said that you mustn't marry your brother's widow, and Henry, not surprisingly, decided that because his marriage had not produced a son, uh, his marriage must be cursed by God, it must be wrong. So right from the outset, that principle of the trump card being the clear word of Scripture um, and being more important um, than the pronouncements of the Pope is at the heart of, of Henry's Reformation. Um, this leads the Protestants to think that perhaps he's one of them, um, but they, in some ways they misjudge their man. He, he never is. But once Henry had broken with Rome, he became increasingly convinced that God had appointed him head over his subjects' spiritual lives as well as their temporal lives, just like the Old Testament kings, King David or King Solomon, that he was specially charged by God with looking after his subjects' spiritual welfare. And that, I think, convinced Henry that the supremacy wasn't just a practical business of sorting out his marriage problems, it was actually something that God had given him as part of his responsibilities as king. And that's the way he came to think of it more and more as the reign went on. And yet, on the other hand, he also rejects the Protestant idea of justification by faith, um, which had replaced purgatory. So he certainly fears the potential of the Reformation to both in, ter in theological and social terms to become too radical. In particular, issuing the English Bible. And in 1543, an act of parliament was passed which restricted who was allowed to read the English Bible only to the upper classes. The idea seems to have been that you could trust uh, educated and socially elevated people to read the Bible in English and know what to make of it, whereas ordinary people wouldn't really understand it, would just start having arguments. And Henry's main worry, I think, was disorder, that people would start uh, arguing about what the Bible meant in pubs, having fights about it, and you could end up with a rebellion or a civil war. The only way perhaps we can describe Henry's religion is to call it Henrychianism. It's personal to him, um, and perhaps during his reign, other people pretend to go along with it, but once Henry is dead, there aren't any other Henricians around. 